pass it over to you. Yeah, all right. Well, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Justin Robinson. I'm from Mobile, Alabama. Uh, born and raised there. I'm living out in Atlanta right now. Um, I got to Atlanta. I went to grad school, and that's when I relocated out here. Um, honestly, guys, you know, my journey is it's, it's all self-taught. You know, um, it's great that you guys are getting the instructions and um, learning, you know, different techniques, terminology, getting to utilize different equipment. And my background and all that was like from the ground zero working up. Um, a lot of stuff I had to figure out on my own, just research, and uh, I went to school for definitely not culinary. Uh, I wanted to be a surgical PA, um, you know, graduating from Auburn University in Alabama. Uh, my undergrad was in biomedical sciences. Um, then I moved out to Atlanta, and I got my master's in public health. But going through the steps, you know, from graduating to moving to Atlanta, you know, I just really wanted to do something that I love, uh, wanted to really figure out a way to make money and monetize what I felt was my new discovered passion. And from that is what I'm a little, um, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about uh, because, you know, everyone's passion and drive is different. You know, um, all you are, you know, men and women are hardworking people, you know what I'm saying? And your talents and your drive equates to someone else's, but it's in a different stream in this culinary world. So I say that to say there's a lot of different ways that you can make money out here. 100%. Um, a lot of people who are self-taught, go to culinary school, um, what have you, they can have different avenues, whether it's through YouTube, Instagram, people want to start at restaurants, food trucks, private chef, meal prep, the list goes on and on, but it's really about discovering which avenue that is best suited for your talent. You know, a lot of people can't plate food, but they can sling out a lot of great food on a food truck. Um, both have their different streams of revenue and different ways that can interest you. So that's also something I'm going to ask about you. Um, kind of like which direction that you may individually feel that you want to go down the route because um, just I've tapped into every single stream that I could to figure out for myself. I didn't really reach out for help and that's just me. Uh, I want to say stubborn but just I just don't want to be influenced by someone else's um, I guess their experience because everyone experience varies and everyone's different. You know, one person may have it down to a T how to acquire clients, how to um, ship out meal preps and, you know, cook for thousands of people while another person is just mainly to be on the line, cook on the line, dish their own, you know, talent and their own um, role in the restaurant on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so that's just a little glimpse about me. I'm 26 year old. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's people older and younger in the room, but uh, that's just how I got to this point for sure. Um, so again, I went to school to be a physician assistant um, and this entrepreneurial journey really came about when I was in grad school, like I talked about. It wasn't until I graduated, I got my master's. I was like, all right, I can go work in the field or I can continue to run my business. Um, I really wasn't doing anything for profit in undergrad, so I really started this business in 2017. So we're talking about three years ago, freshly moved to Atlanta, don't know many people, you know, it's just really posting on social media and word of mouth. And word of mouth was my biggest key player uh, to the success of my business. Um, you know, I there's a lot of celebrities out in the world a lot live in Atlanta there's none that live in Alabama so the thought of me doing work for different celebrities was slim to none and uh, Monica Brown she's an R&B singer uh, I don't know if y'all um, been watching the verses but she just did a versus with I think it was Jill Scott or something like that um, but I was able to be her private chef Brandy, <laughs> Brandy, I'm tripping, I'm tripping, I'm tripping, Brandy, 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 right? uh, But yeah, she made a post on Instagram, and um, she was like, I need a private chef in Atlanta. Again, I had just moved out to Atlanta, I really wasn't thinking much of it, but I just comprised all my best dishes, posted it on social media, I told all my followers, hey guys, if you really support me, could you add her, and let's just see where it goes. And I ended up getting the gig, and I was cooking for her um, and her kids and her parents um, probably three to four times a week for three months consistently. And I doubted myself, too. I was like, you know, there's no way that I'm going to get it. 
I just moved here. There's plenty of other chefs in Atlanta who cook great food. These people got thousands of followers. People got verified blue checks. I'm sitting here with just maybe 4,000 followers at the time. You know what I'm saying? And I'd say all that to say never doubt yourself. Don't ever compare yourself to anyone's work. Um, you know, you don't, my, my, um, my train of thought is just like, you don't have to be the most talented person in the room. You don't have to be the most gifted person in the room, the best looking person in the room, but you got to be the hardest working person in the room. I say you put me in a room with any of those chefs who were trying to compete, compete for the job. You know, I'm, I'm a damn sure outwork every single last one of them. That's just my, that's my train of thought and how I go about my business. And people who want to come help, people who want to, you know, help me out in the kitchen or help the business, when you grow your business, you're going to have to have a system in place. It's going to get to a point in time where you can't do everything yourself. And passing off that responsibility is going to be really key in getting the right team, the right people in place. And I'm sure y'all are dealing with that, um, doing what you're doing now. And it took a lot of time to try to really find the key players to help me grow my business because you know, earlier this morning when I was supposed to get on the call, um, I'm actually ju uh, juggling a couple of different positions. Uh, I'm an epidemiologist for the Department of Public Health. Uh, that came about because COVID definitely took a hit on the business. But now I'm pretty sure that y'all see that a lot of people really don't care anymore. You know, people wearing masks, but they're still going out, still going to the bar, still doing what they do. And the promotion that I got, I'm over all the restaurants and groceries and hotels in the Cobb and Douglas Department of um, or County of Atlanta. So one grocery store had a pretty bad outbreak and I got hit with that as soon as I um, walked through the door. So I apologize again for, you know, uh, missing that meeting, but I'm glad we can get on now. But all that to say is while I'm juggling that, I have to have someone else taking care of inquiries. You know, making sure that there's no money left on the table because money left on the table is money missed out on. So um, I, I definitely would say when you get to that point, just be sure that you delegate to the right people. I've had a couple of people who come in and out um, just because their worth ethic isn't the same. I got one thing to take away from all that. I would say just know that no one's going to work. I mean, no one is going to work as hard as you are for your own business. It doesn't matter if you got the cream of the crop in the industry. They are not going to go as hard for you as you will for your own business. And the quicker you understand that, it's easier to navigate through the people who want to reach out to you. Because everyone's destined for success, man. Like, everyone's set up to swim. There's no one, you know, on this conversation that is going to drown when thrown in the water. You know what I'm saying? And I, no pun intended. Like, I say, like, you have to swim. It doesn't matter how stressful things get no matter how much work gets built up and it feels just like the water is getting deeper and deeper like you have to swim uh and get yourself out that hole to keep going towards success and i say that all the time because you know i've been placed in rooms with people who i never thought i would meet another one is uh mr steve harvey like that came about through a friend just saying hey he's in town he's coming from la he's gonna be here for a couple of months and he still is here um, I need a great vegan chef. I don't cook vegan, never ate vegan food, but it's about making yourself versatile in the field. Like, like I said, you know, I moving to Atlanta was definitely a culture shock from what I'm used to. You know, you have a lot of country, Southern, Cajun food out in Atlanta. You have people who are doing vegan, vegetarian, clean eating. And to be successful, you have to be able to adapt to your atmosphere. So I adapted, I, I tiptoed in each of the different um, avenues and markets that were out here just so I could be equipped. It's crazy to say this because I stopped cooking uh, for Monica when she wanted to go vegan because I had no clue how to cook vegan food. Then we fast forward a year and some change later, the only thing I'm cooking for, you know, Steve Harvey is vegan food um, to help him with his goals. So, you know, I did that for three and a half months, cooked their Christmas dinner, elaborate again everything is from scratch i'm cooking a crown roast a meat i never cooked before i'm using equipment that i've never used before top of line pans and knives again even though it may be your first time utilizing something or preparing a recipe as long as you do the research you make yourself feel comfortable in the atmosphere you adapt and you knock out the task 
there never was a time where they knew that this was my first time doing something. Every single dish that I cooked was my first time doing something. And I nailed it every time. And I honestly would say it's a mix between a God-given blessed talent and just knowing that, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to allow it to fail. There's a lot of stuff that went wrong. I know a lot of stuff go wrong in the kitchen, but um, it's just not showing that under pressure. Um, and I feel like that helped me to be at the level of success that I am now. And I wouldn't consider myself a successful entrepreneur, successful, this high salt value chef. I, I, I mean, I'm still grinding, you know, boots to the ground on every single day. You know, I, I don't take anything for granted. And uh, another another thing, like I said, just don't doubt yourself, guys. Like sometimes things are kind of hard to understand or grasp fully. Um, but another example was uh, when I was in grad school, uh, my secretary, the secretary at the school, she told me about the MasterChef audition. I know a couple of y'all have heard about MasterChef, if not all y'all. Um, and 20,000 people tried out. And they said over hundreds of thousands of people would try out, will you be top tier to make it through the cut? And in my head, again, I'm like, there's no freaking way all these people that I'm even going to get out there. Secondly, this show with Gordon Ramsay, like, that doesn't even seem like my style. I'd be damned if he starts yelling at me because he got the wrong guy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> she said, you know, don't ever let me hear you doubt yourself. You know what I'm saying? You just as, you know, talented as the next person is free and it's tryouts are here in Atlanta. You have no reason why you shouldn't try out. So I knocked out the 16-page application. That's really why I was dreading it. You know, on top of school work, a 16-page application is pretty crazy. So anyways, I knocked it out, submitted it. There's about 586 people who tried out. I was number 386. Um, of that 586, only 16 people made it through. And I was one of them. And the dish that I cooked, I'm 100% allergic to. Couldn't even taste it. I had to ask my girlfriend to taste it just so I can know if it's going to be good or not. And hope she didn't lie to me. Uh, but I'm allergic to shellfish. So I'm allergic to shellfish. I cook it all the time. But it's just like, you just got to use your senses. You know, I talk about that um, in my cookbook, in my master academy. And I'll touch on that in a second. But you just got to use what you've been gifted with, guys and, and women. Uh, you just got to be you know, you just got to utilize it. And that's what I've been doing, man. And it's getting me to the point where I am now to keep elevating flavors, elevating technique, even though I haven't been, you know, formally trained. So I ended up making it all the way to the top 80. They flew me out to LA. I was out there for two weeks before I got cut when they made the cut from 80 to 40. And that's the 40 that they took on television. But during that time, meeting everybody, seeing how the show developed, I quickly realized that I wasn't cut because of my talent. And I'm a happy-go-lucky guy. I'm very thankful, like I said, every day to wake up and be able to grind and stuff like that. I don't have a sad sob story. I don't have anything that makes my whole story unique aside from the grind. You know what I'm saying? I just bust my tail every day, and that's mainly what I talked about. Um, and looking at, you know, looking back on the experience, I'm glad I was open to that because a lot more opportunities have come from that, from business, from, you know, future networks, you know, reaching out, hopefully great things come to play and this whole conversation will make sense, you know what I'm saying? But it's just taking everything that you're faced with as an experience to learn from and better yourself. Sure. hundred percent. Um, now does anyone, uh, kind of own their own business or have a side business outside of, um, everything that's going on. Nobody. Okay. I'll say, you know, we'll put their business out in public right now. <laughs> okay. 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 Well, All right. I don't have a business per se, but I am also from Atlanta, and I've been thinking about starting a side business. And my my only problem is everything that I want to do is already done five hundred times over. If I do soul food, there is so many soul food restaurants on every corner of Atlanta. If I do a food truck, there are so many different food trucks here in Virginia or in Atlanta everywhere. So what is going to make me unique that somebody's going to want to buy food that I'm selling? Great, great question. Prime example is meal prep. Everybody and their mom is trying to meal prep. Everyone is meal prepping. People are tired of cooking. 
uh, COVID hits, people just want something quick, easy, and accessible. But what makes, and I say this to myself, what's going to make my meal prep stand out? You got to think about two things, um, accessibility and, and, and affordability, so two A's. So if you make it accessible and affordable, then your competitor, you win. Every time you win. How do you show that? It's with um, it's with three C's. The three C's is credibility. Make sure that you're credible. You show that you're you're a person of integrity. You show that you what goes on in the kitchen is what you put out. There's no um, there's no like people will post stuff crazy filter. It doesn't look like what it's supposed to. People will know that it doesn't taste good. Get a certain angle, and people feel like they're gypped out. But if you show like, hey, I woke up 5 o'clock in the morning, I'm prepping and everything, I'm cooking, this is how I cook it off, this is how I played it, this is why, this is good for you, I actually care about your health, I'm not just trying to sell you a product, that builds your credibility. That credibility is going to build a concern. People are going to swipe up, DM you, say, dang, that looks good, you know, how much does this cost, you know what I'm saying, um, like how, how, how do I get in contact with you or whoever to get this so you got the credibility that credibility is just something that you keep building on you literally drive it down their throat with content so content by posting on social media posting going uh, Facebook sending out uh, to your friends you just keep posting that content that builds that credibility that's going to bring a concern and from that concern is when you turn it into cash so those will be the three C's that um, I want you guys to take away because that, that's just something, again, I haven't heard this nowhere. It's just something that I came up with from learning like, dang, the more I post, the more people view it, the more people be like, okay, if the brag ain't green, you ain't eating clean. Like I say that every single time I meal prep and it's literally in people's head like, I know if I get a meal prep from Justin, Chef J-Rob, I'm going to get a clean eat, and I'm going to see the goal. Now, with my background in science, I, I really gauge all my portions to make sure that they obtain their weight loss, weight gain, they have diabetes, make sure that I don't use salt, make sure I use a lot more herbs, more so than a lot more of different flavored agents. Uh, use the natural fruits and acidity from a lime and a lemon to squeeze onto a cabbage to bring out the flavor in it because cabbage is a water soluble vegetable as you guys know. So many different water soluble vegetables and packing those into the meal prep feels the meal prep. They feel like they're getting a lot. They take it in, they feel full, but they lose weight and it drops like flies. And that's just a simple tip that I give to a lot of people who ask, hey, how do I start on meal prep? How do I, you know, and cabbage is very cheap, you know. Um, so this is a really good go-to. Uh, I think I've nailed the flavor down on that. Uh, what I do is I take a mojito lime seasoning, squeeze of uh, lime, lemon as well. Sometimes I might zest an orange just to bring out all that citrus into the cabbage, and I steam it. Uh, so I cut any oils. There's just natural heat coming from it. It brings it down. No salt. Maybe some peppercorn. Not pepper, but peppercorn. Because, you know, that flavor is very, very strong. And it, it, it's a home run every time. It's a home run every time. And just for color pop, I use purple cabbage instead of green cabbage. And little stuff like that makes me different. There's no one who I've seen use purple cabbage since I started using it. I can guarantee it. Like, I, I, every time I see it, I'm like, it's all good. It's enough room for everybody to eat, but come on. Come on. You know what I'm saying? So, like, you have to make your own lane, and even when people copy you, you have to keep driving it and elevating it. Some things you show, some things you don't show. Nobody knows the recipe to this cabbage besides y'all, and I just told y'all. Like, that's how I do it every time. That's where it doesn't matter how good it looks on someone else's social media. I know that it's not going to have that same quality and care and effort put behind it. And that's what you have to do, whether you want to open up your own food truck, if you want to start doing private dining, whether no matter which avenue you want to roll with, you have to make sure that you pick it, you develop it, and you just drive it. You drive the nail down with the hammer. 
Great question, though. That's a great question. Hey, Justin, uh, I got a question for you um, about uh, your your new uh, cookbook that's coming out. Um, so what? So uh, I, I got to admit, you know, hearing that you really started into it in 2017, and here you are now. Uh, the big question is: is that that's a pretty bold move? And I'm glad to see that you're taking as bold a move as you are. But uh, what, what was your inspiration and, uh, you know, what was the driver behind that? Yeah, just being fully transparent with y'all. Um, you know, I, um, again, like being 26 now, um, at the time when I first heard you should do a cookbook, I was around 24. Um, so two years of constant, you know, hey, you should do it, you should do it. I started to just work on it behind the scenes. And it wasn't until the pandemic hit when I was like, all right, let's just go ahead and knock it out since I got some downtime. Uh, being honest with y'all, it cost a crap ton of money. I didn't know what I was doing. Everything was from scratch. I, um, I pledged when I was an undergrad, um, Alpha Phi Alpha, so I'm Alpha. And the guys who I pledged, one ended up starting his own publishing company. So I was like, you know what, I'll go through you. I'm not going to go through a main published company. I trust you. I know you're not going to do me wrong. Talk price point and talk business. And the rights that I receive from publishing are three times better than if I was to go to a mainstream published company where they get a percentage of every sale and I don't really receive too much. Um, so I have three things that I pushed out that was my goal in 2020. The cookbook, a master academy and my own cutlery line. So the master academy, similar to I don't know if you guys seen master class, seen ads on that, uh, where they have you know yeah you guys um, high high recognized Gordon game plug teach you the different techniques and methods on doing that. Well, uh, during the climate that we're in now, I'm thinking like okay this this is great, but there's a lot of other great talented people, other great black people who can be in the culinary world who really nail things just as good that you can learn from. And I want to create a platform for us to learn those techniques. And that's why I created Master Academy. Um, and I'm the pilot for it. I created a 12 episode series where, um, and it's crazy, I, I'll wake up at three o'clock in the morning. That doesn't seem early for y'all, but for other people it's crazy. Three o'clock in the morning. Uh, all the way until midnight, go to sleep, run it back. And I did that for three days straight to record all this footage to get the episodes that I need. We're um, talking about knife techniques, seasoning, flavor profiles, simple dishes to elegant dishes, um, how to prepare a whole spread like a brunch party spread because brunch is a really big thing here in Atlanta. Just things that you know will be utilized by people, not just people buying something just for support. You have to, that's another thing. You when, when you do things on social media, if you're thinking about it from a marketing standpoint, you have to post and meet the viewer's need. Not what you want to do or what you need, but they need to see a post and be like, I need this or I want this. Not because that's what is going to acquire your sales. So I'm tapping into everything that I know everybody loves. Brunch, they love mimosas, they love great food. They, they, they want to learn, but they want to learn in a fun way. So that was my reasoning for creating Master Academy, and that's going to be released later in the year. Now, the cookbook, all this, just being straight up, all this costs 10000 for me to put on because I had to get the production, I had to get the groceries, the equipment, um, had to rent out an Airbnb because I do taxes too, guys. Uh, the, and that's where I got the money to do this. I grinded my tail off during the tax season because I just knew this was going to be something I was going to do in the future. So um, I'm a tax preparer, and my tax client, he owns a great million-dollar company. I asked him if I could use his house. He said yes, and he ended up flaking last minute for business reasons. So I was like, it is what it is. I'm in a bind. I already booked everything. I'm going to have to just fork over money for Airbnb. That looks aesthetically pleasing. So... That's where a big expense came from, too. But at the end of the day, like I said, when things keep piling up, you just have to keep swimming through it. And that's what I did. So the whole the whole project took um, about a week and a half. Um, the cookbook, I did 
um, actually in my loft downstairs because all you have to do is take pictures. So um, I knocked that out. What inspired me to do it really was just putting all my recipes, all my originality, you know, and getting tired of people DM me asking, uh, how do you cook this and that? So uh, um, that's really what got me started to do it. Um, so my goal is to knock out 300 copies. I'm just about there to just make my money back. And from there, everything will start going into profit. And it's just all about having that strategy, believing in yourself, making sure that you're set up to acquire those type of goals. And uh, I'll, I'll send you the link, Julian. So um, if you guys want to get it, by all means, I'll be more than happy to sign a copy and send it over to y'all for sure. And then my cutlery line. So that took a lot of research, about seven months of research. Um, and then have you have have you guys heard of Made In, the, the uh, yeah. cookware app? I'm in touch yeah. with them trying to get my um, own collaboration of uh, cookware. So I'm just trying to provide the best quality for those two A's, affordability and accessibility. I want to provide, I want to be that go-to kitchen line um, that people can buy that's an affordable price and that's not going to break down on them, you know, down the road. Uh, so did a lot of research, found a great manufacturing company that hand forges the knives. It's not mass produced take the time and quality to each individual knife. And to support uh, my friends, I have her um, engraving my logo into the wood of the um, handle. So it's a great um, 440C uh, steel hand forged blade, great quality. It's really the sharpest knife that I've seen. Um, the other sharpest knife I've seen is Dow Strong. Have you guys heard of Dow Strong? That brand, great. they have great knives. Um, it's hand in hand with them hand in hand with them. So that's what I'm going for. You know, I'm, I, if I feel like someone else can acquire it, then I can too. And I'll do whatever it takes to get to that point. And that's just that mindset that I have for it. So Jay, question for you. Uh, whenever you want to test that Master Academy, come on down. We, we'll put it through the trials. Where, come on down. We want where y'all looking at? Down in Virginia. Virginia? I'm going to have to uh, look into some flights. Man. Yeah, I'm yeah. Now that we had this Zoom call. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're we, we going to put this to work. But uh, with that, uh, I, I've been impressed with your background and the way you carried yourself. So I followed you uh, from the beginning. But my question is, do you have a passion for the culinary arts or is this another stream of income that you just have mastered? I mean, because we have some guys that have a passion for it and do whatever. But is this a passion or is this a, a stream that you have mastered? It's 100% a passion. I, I literally was thinking this, me missing this Zoom call this morning had me thinking like, all right, it might be time for me to go ahead and um, drop the epidemiology position so I can refocus on what I love to do. You know what I'm saying? I love helping people. I love bettering people's health um, through the epidemiology job. But stuff like this is, is just, it was unacceptable from my standard. You know what I'm saying? And uh, the first day I cooked for Steve, he sat me down. Uh, at his uh, pool, and he had brought two things of lemonade. He had a cigar. I was hoping I was going to get a cigar, but I didn't get it. <laughs> he said, "Look, dude, what got you here is not is not those those degrees. You're a smart dude, but those those degrees on on your wall that's just paper. That paper doesn't mean shit. This right here, your passion is what got you here. You cooking is what put you." In front of me and you cooking for me and that's when I realized like all right this this is really a game changer because like that resonated with me and I share that all the time because your papish your passion and your purpose is what's going to always make you happy so what's going to put money in your pockets and make you want to wake up and do it all over again the next day um cooking I love doing it you know if it's a 12 hour cook off where I'm meal prepping, multiple bookings, weddings, doesn't matter. Like, I don't get tired from it. I just love every single time I start prepping a new dish, whatever. Yeah, it's, it's, it's overwhelming sometimes. Yeah, you physically get tired, but mentally, I'm always in the game. So that passion, really, you have to really tap into, guys. You got to really think, like, all right, I like cooking. I love cooking, but what about it excites me? And the moment that you answer that is how you want to navigate in this culinary world. Culinary world is so big, you know what I'm saying? And people can 
be a TV production. People can meal prep. People can food truck, run a restaurant. But if ordering people around, putting people in place, executing business is not your forte, it doesn't drive you and excite you about food, you don't need to run a restaurant. You might need to dial down a little bit to a food truck. If you don't want to do a lot of prep work or really be the front face of a company, maybe a food truck is in it. Maybe you need to dial back and just do a catering and send people out once you cook the food, you have great food, but you don't want to spend the time at an event and you send people out, maybe that might benefit you more. All of which can be great streams of revenue and income. And it's not always about the money when you first started off. Like even myself, like I really wasn't making much. You know, I was just doing it because I loved it. And just love seeing that smile and that reaction when people take their first bite. And even today, it still holds that weight. But I just figured out how to be business minded about it. And y'all can feel free to take down my information um, outside of Instagram. And if you ever want to hop on a call and just go around the business aspect of starting your business, LLC in it, business license, you know, food licensing and whatnot, I'll be more than happy to take care of that for you. And even send over, um, well, I send a lot of my tax clients the bookkeeping pamphlet so that you can keep up with your expenses and um, kind of cross-reference to the profit that you bring in because when you see those numbers, it makes a lot more sense. Like it came to the point now where I just ordered a commercial refrigerator and had to take the door hinges out my apartment to get it through just because the business has expanded to that T. And, you know, like whatever I need to do, that's what, I, that's what I'm going to do for sure. Awesome. Hey, hey Justin, I got a question. I'm sorry. Um, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I, uh, I connected with you is um, um, I uh, I got a Traeger, and I see you always uh, wolfing it on on that Traeger, <laughs> man. And uh, anyone who's who's doing uh, greatness on a Traeger grill, I'm, I'm focused in on because uh, you know there's there's easy and hard on the Traeger. And uh, uh, what's your favorite dish on there, and like what? What attracted you about the, about, about uh, smoking like that? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I'm excited to hear what what uh, what grill you have. Uh, it's the I forget the exact number, but it's the one with the Wi-Fi and it's the large. Pro 780. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Okay. All right. Yeah. So the Pro 780 was my first one. I had um, I call her old Betsy. She been through 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 a lot. Uh, caught on fire twice. You know, one was at a barbecue. Yeah, I'm telling you, like, that was a sight. Um, it was at the Beer Bourbon and Barbecue Festival, 3,000 attendants. I was the VIP chef, lots of spotlight, and that bad boy caught on fire in front of all the people, The your typical be big bearded, you know what I'm saying, beer drinking, you know, pit masters around me. And they're looking at, who's this skinny dude over here with a grill caught on fire and it looks like it's plugged up. You know what I'm saying? Like that's, that's the, that was the scene. Just the and then my sister's like, get the fire extinguisher, put it out. I'm like, heck no, I'm not going to look like a rookie out here. Like I'm just going to have to deal with it, you know? But, uh, uh, to answer the question, my favorite dish to cook on the Traeger has to be a, 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 a lamb leg. hundred percent, hundred percent. That Traeger on that lamb leg is night and day. Uh, what I do is I take the lamb leg, of course, trim the fat. Um, I take it out the netting. Um, I've seen a lot of people keep it in the net to keep it almost in the roast form, but I want it to lay out on the grate. So um, I take that, I inject it with a Cajun butter, um, just a simple Cajun butter, just because, I mean, that's what we did in Alabama, inject any big meat with some Cajun butter. And then um, for the seasoning, I use rosemary, mint, salt, pepper. And there's this new seasoning that I want you guys to check out. They're called Kinders. Um, if you never heard of Kinders, they're based out in California. I actually talked to the, the, the one that got the actual CEO of it um, once I got sponsored by Traeger. And he's, he's a great dude. But that seasoning blend, night and day. Usually you have to use a seasoned blend with an additional salt, additional pepper. They have it down to a they have it down to a T. Their blends are are amazing. And I use buttery steakhouse. Um, and I season that lamb up inside out. And then I roll it on the Traeger. Uh, there's two different ways I do it. 310 for an hour, perfect medium rare. 
Um, recently, for a guest, I did it at 220 for about two hours. And then I crunk it up to 450 to get a nice crisp skin on it until it reached rare. And just because I know they're not going to eat rare, um, I dialed it back down to 220 uh, to get that perfect uh, medium rare cook in there. And it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm definitely. Uh, do y'all have a, a Traeger at the school? Well, well, see, I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> We've been trying to convince the boss that we need one of those for experimentation purposes and learning. So I think you went home. Hey, listen. We're gonna, we're gonna. All right, I'm gonna get. Um, I'm actually taking over their live uh, next Thursday, September 24th. So if you guys tune in on their live, you'll see me um, cooking a, um, a lamb shank with um a beard uh a beard um uh, queso cheese dip for some pretzels um so definitely check me out on that guys i'm gonna um shout you guys out for sure and i'm gonna let them know that um that y'all need a traeger and we're gonna get that we're gonna get that taken care of we'll be in contact julian um yeah i'm, I'm sure they'll be more than happy to make that happen i'll um i'll get in contact with them all right jay i'm gonna bug him so we can bug you so i'm gonna get yeah. I'm a man of my word. I'm going to let them know ASAP and see what we can do, man, for sure. All right, I'm going to hold you to it. So, uh, uh, any other questions before I go ahead, before I get another one? Hey, Justin. Uh, first off, I just want to start off saying uh, War Eagle, always. War Eagle. Um, War Eagle. Always. Um, so, my big question is going to be, so, us being in the military, so, we work, we cook for tons and tons of people, and, uh, Sometimes we hear the good critiques, and then sometimes we hear the bad critiques. So throughout your experience, what do you take from the negative criticism that you sometimes get um, on certain dishes that you plate? Do you reevaluate yourself on what you're putting on that plate? Or if you're getting more positive feedback, or do you, do you not um, reevaluate what you put on that plate? That's a great question. I've always gotten positive feedback until I – was able to connect with the next step up and people who really know what they're doing, really know how to distinguish flavors and plating. Um, so that was from MasterChef. So the friends and people who I connected with on there, um, top notch, top line, some of the best in America. And one of which, his name is Noah. Um, he lives in Blue Ridge, Georgia, about an hour out. Um, real country dude complete opposite of me you know what I'm saying but we connect because we say real recognize real so um, he keeps it real with me every single time if I post something on Instagram where it could be a simple steak mashed potatoes and asparagus him and I both know that that's not that I suggested I should cook because I'm always thinking about elevating the game thinking about plating but they want something simple so that's what I give them and that's what I post but he'll say you know you're you're that I bet the flavors are amazing, but your plating is absolutely awful. And I take that, you know what I'm saying, and just take it like, damn, you're right. You know what I'm saying? I'm looking back at it, the picture, and it's just like, all right, well, now I know every time that I put something out, if he's thinking it, someone else is thinking it. And if someone else is thinking it, I need to take a step back and reevaluate how I'm kind of presenting things. Because even though the client appreciated it, they loved it. It was the best meal they ever had. What is that content going to build? It can't build a concern if someone thinks that they can do it better or, or you know, it's not the best that they've seen. So I've taken everything that everyone ever says, you know, um, if something is salty, too salty for them, I think about how I can kind of reconstruct the recipe to make sure that it's, it reached a wider range of palates. Because everyone's palate's different. You're not going to always please everybody. Um, but it's, it's about appealing to the masses as much as possible because I feel like if you start to get too much criticism, then that's something that you have to take on with what you're actually doing and that kind of can tap into your passion for it because now you're not having fun with doing it and creating flavors and making things exciting for you. You're worried about trying to please other people. And more so, I feel like if I please myself, in the taste that it's going to please others. So I'm always cooking for myself. Uh, private dinners, caterings, I literally cook for myself how I want it to taste because they booked me. It's my creative, you know, right and talent of what I'm putting on the table. 
and it should be your expectations to be one of the best dishes or bites that you ever had. And of course, those leftovers in the fridge always, you know, make for a great lunch and dinner. You know what I'm saying? So that's just how I see everything. Um, but you know, don't don't get too down um, on yourselves if something's like a really hard criticism. Just take that honesty as you know a great appreciation for what you're doing. Do you guys have a chance to work on your own things outside of cooking in the military? No, there we go. What was the question? Do you have time to like, I, you, you're cooking a lot in the military, but in regards to kind of like outside of the military, if you want to run your own thing, do your own thing, um, do you have time to develop those thoughts? Uh, some people do, uh, those people take advantage of it. And what we've created here, we've given them an outlet to work on their creative talents here. Because not only will it benefit us, it will benefit them in the long run. So we get it now while they're in service and they can work on themselves when they're out of the uniform. So it's a two for one deal. So we do give them that that outlet to work on it here. All right, uh, we'll, we'll uh, open it up for a few more questions and then uh, we'll give you the last word. Anything else? I had a question for you. So um, I, I love I love how you can see it in your face that you really have a passion for food service, right? And, and for putting out quality. Uh, have you ever? considered pursuing your culinary arts education further than you know what I mean you, you, you get what I'm saying 100% um, I know that someone who has been formally trained will always have an upper hand in certain areas uh, the only thing that has deterred me from taking that next step spending more money and getting formal training was that you can't compromise flavor you know and I say this like my style of cooking and flavor is who I am as a chef or a cook, you know, uh, however people want to use the term or the case may be. Like, I call myself Atlanta's greatest chef because I'm confident in what I'm putting out and the flavor that I provide is unique in itself. It's not a title that I'm taking on as just Robinson is the greatest everyone else can screw off. It's, it's more so like a mentality. I want, I want to build that competition in Atlanta for people to be like, all right, I know I can outdo him. Let's see if he can do, like, I, I like competition. I like I like that grit, you know, I, that that's what it's like to me. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you want to call me out, call me out. Let's, let's, let's go to work and go toe to toe. You know what I'm saying? Because like I said, you can be more talented than me. You Plating can be 30 times better than me, but when it comes to the taste of that flavor on the plate, I'm going to work my tail off in the kitchen, and I know for a fact it's going to outbeat you. So everything else can play from that, but that's just that mindset that I bring when I'm cooking. So um, back, back to tie it on in with culinary school, I just feel like what I would learn in culinary school, um, and given the fact that I might not know much about what culinary school has to offer, but I just feel like the only thing that could be improved is that technique, but that flavor is something that I'm going to stay true to. So if I'm going to stay true to that, then over time I can develop my own plating, my own different methods and techniques, you know what I'm saying? Um, so that's, that's just my thought process on that. So with that, I, I, I like your boldness. I, I, I love it being out front. So, but is there anyone, is there any chef that you look up to, aspire to be like, or to make yourself greater than? Is there anybody out there? That's a great question. I, um, I, I've been getting that question a, a lot more frequently later since I've been putting out the cookbooks and stuff. And um, at first I didn't have the answer, but now when I really think about it, because I talk to him a lot, um, it's my girlfriend's dad. He's formally trained. Um, he went to culinary school, the American uh, Culinary Institute. Um, newspaper you know articles about all the work he's done he owns four restaurants um in lagrange georgia and the first time i met him you know we sat down and had to talk about what i'm doing what i have going on and every single business idea i have it's a shot down no you don't need to do it this way this is how you need to do it you got it all wrong blah 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 then it came down to a point where my girl was like you know y'all should do a cook-off and i was like heck yeah let's do a cook-off and um, I said I wanted to do a rack of lamb. I know I can nail a rack of lamb. 
I'll put that against, you know, anybody. And, and that's what we did. We did a rack of lamb cook-off. And I think I beat him. I honestly think I beat him. His cooking and his technique and plating uh, had me beat. But like I said, when it comes back down to that flavor, I think the flavor of the actual lamb chop had him beat, honestly, I can say. And uh, he just has a lot of different things that I learned from, from a business standpoint, since he owns four restaurants, since I'm trying to own my own one day. Um, and what I'm trying to do is a little bit um, left field from what a lot of people are doing. Um, again, I'm thinking business minded. Um, you know, I have the luxury of waking up, going downstairs, and if I have a private dining, it's downstairs. So I like that um, that accessibility to have your place of business where you stay. Um, so I plan on having a, a, a piece of property, commercial and residential zone where I stay on property, have my, what I call a pop-up restaurant, um, where people can come dine, they can host events. And uh, since my girlfriend, she's a sommelier, um, you don't know what that is, it's basically a wine yep. enthusiast. Um, um, she has her own area too, because now we're having schedule conflicts. She wants a tasting for 14, the same time I'm having a dining for two. And no party or client is better than the other. So how are we going to make it shake? And it's about taking that next step. And the reason why I want to do that is because um, you have a lot more tax write-offs. Because <laughs> that personal use is your business use. And you don't have to worry. You don't have to keep paying a, a building in Atlanta $4,000 in, in, in property tax and rent a month. And you, you're not guaranteed that business with COVID. You know what I'm saying? Like, yes, things are opening up a little bit, bit more, but having that control over your own property and under your own business is just that next step. And it takes your business credit and everything that you want to do in life to that next level because it's at your accessibility. And that's just how I kind of been thinking about things and what I'm trying to work on. So are you and Asama Ye going to a joint bank? Uh, venture here soon. So uh, our first, our first big dinner was a, a Valentine's dinner. We called it um, Experience EXO. It was a five course dinner for uh, fifty. It was fifty four that showed up on a, a large estate table. Beautiful decorations, beautiful layout. Never done nothing like this before. Everything again from scratch, but you just gotta throw when you're thrown in it. You just gotta you know make it shake. So. Um, sourced out all the plateware, decorations, um, set up, um, renting out um, commercial um, tools and commercial equipment like the the the, um, the rolling rolling cart uh, refrigerator, um, uh, commercial two commercial ovens that were rolled in, plugged in, set up everything to make everything successful. Having no type of experience, I made it happen. It was a beautiful event. Um, contracted in 25 servers to roll out all the courses, clean up, wash dishes, come back. Again, never done none of that, but just got to be in that position. The shot caller, feel confident in what you're doing, and when you give out those orders, people are like, okay, if, if Justin's comfortable, if he's not stressed, even though you know 20 plates didn't show up and you made a, a way around it, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm comfortable. As long as you make others who are working for you feel comfortable, then, you know, things go a lot more smoother than what's really happening. But that rollout was amazing. Um, so my girl paired a wine for each of those five courses. Um, we came out, talked to the crowd. Uh, you know, it was just a really great event. So we're doing that every year. Um, and our goal is to do, like, a, a, a seated dinner similar to that, but look a lot more small scale at the end of each month. Um, and use that money, say, for instance, if we were to profit, uh, let's just say $1,500 from that one dinner uh, for the five-course pairing dinner. That $1,500 would go straight into the mortgage for the whole build-out of everything. Mm -hmm. So it's using our time to pay for what we want or need to run our businesses, and everything outside of that can be generated straight revenue. Awesome. Uh, we can go down this rabbit hole for yeah. hours. So I know yeah. we're, we're going to turn this back over to the boss because we can go down this rabbit hole for hours. Hey, hey Justin, I uh, appreciate your time. And um, we're, we're going to wrap it up here. But I'll give you the final word here in a second. But uh, I just want to thank you for uh, taking some time out of your day. I know you're busy, but uh, 
it's a uh, it's a good outside look of um, the the food service industry, and uh, obviously you're a rising star in it. And uh, it's good to see uh, all the new kind of talent and new ideas as to um, taking food service to a different level. As you as you know, um, you know years ago it used to be you know just going out to a nice restaurant and occasional nice cookbook, but now the game has changed and we've got talent coming coming at you from 100 different directions. And it's uh, it's good to see. And this is definitely going to further our our understanding and our um, our, our uh, culinary arts that we that we put on here at the, the food service school um, aboard Fort Lee in Virginia. But with that, I'll turn it over to you for any final comments. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to close by saying thank you guys for uh, having me. It's, it's definitely a pleasure to talk. 